Hello. Uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Ken Russell. I worked with him for five years at Sun Microsystems. He did uh, a lot of interesting work, mainly concentrating on the hotspot VM. Um, he optimized the reflection in the JDK. It used to involve native method calls. Now it doesn't, and that is almost entirely his work. Um, he did some startup time work. And he optimized locking in JDK 6. That's the, the bias locking stuff. So whether you know it or not, you've been using his stuff for quite some time. But he's not going to be talking about that stuff today. Today, he's going to be talking about applets. So take it away, Ken. Thank you, Josh. So good morning and welcome. Um, the topic of today's talk is applets. We're going to be talking about the reloading of applets and the new Java plugin that has been introduced in JDK 6 update 10. So today's agenda, I want to keep it really informal. I uh, want to do some demos. want to have a little discussion. Let's do it again, over and over. All right. And now, many of you, if you think about applets, you may, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what your conventional wisdom is. So what I'd like to do is defer to some examples that are out there on the web of, um, of some other opinions, some external opinions about applets. So let's see. This is an interview from October. Uh, last year with Ben Galbraith of Ajaxian. Basically a whole rewrite to how applets work in the browser. And I want to talk to you again about that because Java applets have sucked for the past 10 years and we're really excited about the prospects of that change. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that they sucked, Ben, but uh, <laughs> I, I think that there were certainly improvements that could have been made. Uh, All right, so there's a, a brief opinion from Ben Galbraith about uh, the state of applets at the time. Here's another example from the Java Posse. This is their roundup session from 2007 on Java applets uh, and sort of what, what um, should be done in the, in the space of Java client technologies. But we're going to announce that in the Christmas special or the holiday special, which will be coming up very soon. All right. Thanks and enjoy. This is Java Posse roundup 2007, the last not quite the last session, the last technical session before the closing session. Uh, we are talking about applets and why they suck and <laughs> what doesn't suck about them. And another part of this is does Java need an answer to flex? So this will probably go all over the place. I just wanted to kick it off with an opinion and that is that applets suck. Um, but I want to, I want to, be, yeah, I want to be specific and, and give some recommendations that make them not suck. Um, the biggest thing is the plugin. The plugins in the browser. So that's pretty much where we stood as of last year. And so what I'd like to um, very uh, happily announce is that we have changed uh, the implementation of the Java plugin completely. So in Java 6 update 10, which is uh, the release of which is imminent now, we have executed a ground up rewrite of the Java plugin. This is the software in the web browser that makes applets run. An interesting aspect of this rewrite is that the, the new plugin is written mostly in the Java language. And to be honest, the rewrite never would have happened if we had use some more traditional architectures where there was more native code associated with it because we're really using all the features of the language, the high level abstractions, the built-in thread synchronization and multi-threading primitives in order to implement this system. We have uh, a pretty advanced new architecture which executes the applets in a different process than the web browser. And I'm going to show you a little, um, little diagram of what that means in a minute. But there are some major benefits from the rewrite. Number one is improved reliability. The applets are really very strongly walled off from the web browser. And it's basically impossible for an applet to interfere in any way with the, uh, the proper execution of the web browser. The user experience has been improved. Um, applets now load gracefully in the background, and they sort of pop into existence as they become ready without interfering with the scrolling or other rendering of the web page. We have a bunch of new interesting support, like you can now request a larger heap size for your applet if it's a really sophisticated program, just like you could for a desktop application. Um, you can specify even low-level JVM command line arguments to your applet if you need to tune things like the, uh, the graphical acceleration primitives. So without going into too much detail, let's just show what the architecture looks like. 
On the left, you can see this is the web page as it's rendered in the web browser. And maybe we have three applets, hypothetically speaking, running on the page. Now, in the, in the classic Java plugin, you would have a JVM embedded in the web browser, and that would be what was executing all of these three applets. In the new Java plugin, we have the opportunity to spawn a new virtual machine to run any one of these applets. So in this example, you see on the left side, the, uh, the Firefox web browser's process actually does still have a small headless embedded JVM inside. And that's used to mediate the connections to the one or more attached JVMs that are actually executing applets. So in this example, we have uh, one JVM on the top that happens to be executing two of the applets and a second one on the bottom that's executing the third. Uh, by default, I should point out that the sharing characteristics are exactly the same as in the classic plugin, so namely all applets run in the same JVM instance. So we're not uh, doing anything too radical like spawning a new JVM per applet. We're still trying to take advantage of uh, sharing of the running JVM instances. Okay, so this sounds like a fairly major change, right? What did we do about compatibility? How well did we do? Well, we've run hundreds of applets from throughout the web and um, proud, pr proud to say that we've achieved better than 97% backward compatibility with the new system. This is, again, based on the applets that we have run and on customer applets and feedback throughout the beta testing process of Java SE 6 Update 10. And we are continuing to improve as we find you know, little details that we may have uh, not quite done exactly the same way as the old plugin and have the flexibility to, um, to adjust it. So, the main thesis of this whole work was that the applet, um, that the concept of the applet is pretty good. All right? The life cycle is very simple. There are basically four methods that you may want to uh, consider overriding to take control over how your program starts. There's the init method called once at the beginning of time, start and stop, which uh, conceptually can be called more than once, although in practice nowadays they're called exactly once, and then destroy when the applet is about to be terminated. And that life cycle model is completely unchanged in the new plugin. So all we've done is change the, the container, which is just like a Java EE container, it's the applet container, it provides the services to the applet. And all the services, by the way, are completely supported. So things like querying, implicit querying of the browser's proxy settings when the applet attempts to make a network connection, that's all there. Um, access to the browser certificate store and the browser's authenticator if, uh, if a piece of HTML content is protected with a, a password or something, then the applet will, or, or the Java networking stack will route back through that. Um, the applicants request that you show a, a document in another frame on the web page. Java JavaScript integration, which I'll go into in more detail, is also, um, has also been redone and is really robust and really portable. So, um, the most significant new feature of the new Java plugin is built-in integration of JNLP support. Um, have any of you written a Java web start application and deployed it? One, all right, well, representation. Um, so the, major, the, the most important new feature of the new Java plugin is that we've tried to unify the concepts of applets and applications via Java web start. Okay, so now it's possible to use the same exact deployment mechanisms for these two forms of getting your Java content onto the user's desktop, okay? Effectively, what you wanna do is write your program in the form of a component. And in this case, it's you know, a Java AWT component subclass or a, a Swing uh, J component subclass. And then you wanna get most of your logic into that form so that you can basically just choose the top level container into which you wanna put that program. It might be a top level frame in the case of an application or it might be an applet, which is implicitly a container. And I'll show an example of what this looks like in a minute. But this uh, one major feature, one major improvement here is that you can now incorporate JNLP extensions trivially into your applets. So there's a bunch of cool stuff that you can pull into your web started application already today. Like there's the Java OpenGL binding, which I happen to be the maintainer of. Um, which lets you get 3D graphics, hardware accelerated into your Java programs. You can now incorporate that extension trivially into your applet. It's, a, it, it's the identical mechanism, and it's like one line in your JNLP file, and that pulls in that extension. Um, there's a new JavaFX initiative at Sun, which I'll talk briefly about later, which is bringing rich media to the Java platform. And the runtime libraries for this extension are published as JNLP extensions, and then you incorporate them trivially into either an applet or an application. Another cool thing is that you can 
use the JNLP APIs, which have been available to Java Web Start application developers, in your applets, okay? So if you want to store a little bit of data, but you don't want to have to go through the, the process of signing your code or um, presenting a security dialog to the end user, you can get access to a small amount of persistent storage on the machine from your applet by just using the JNLP persistence service. So if you recast your applet and deploy it using this new JNLP support, you get all the benefits of a Java Web Start application in your applet, okay? And by the way, a consequence of the new architecture of the Java plugin means that in the JNLP file, you can request JVM command line arguments. You can uh, say that you would like to run on a particular JRE version. You can auto-download a particular JRE version if you're an enterprise and you want to say, this applet runs best on a certain update of Java 5, for example. All of these capabilities are now supported for applets. Okay, so we've really tried to, um, to unify the, uh, the, the stage between in-browser and out-of-browser deployment. So here's what it looks like. Um, here's your applet tag. You specify your width and height, et cetera. And the way that you point the JNLP file is just using another applet parameter, okay? And this is all uh, covered in the release notes that are up on the web, and I'll have pointers to them later. Um, but basically, you use the new JNLP href applet parameter that points to the JNLP file that contains your applet descriptor. Now, the bottom segment here is the actual contents of that JNLP file. So, in the resources section, you might say, okay, well, I want to run on 1.4 or later. Um, maybe this is a sophisticated applet that needs more Java heap size, so it requests a larger heap size using the max heap size uh, parameter. Maybe it uses OpenGL, and some of you may know that there are incompatibilities between DirectDraw, Direct3D, and OpenGL in Windows, so we may specify a low-level JVM command line arguments for this applet. And then we can reference the uh, the code for the applet and any extensions like Joggle that it might use. And then finally wrap it up with the applet descriptor saying this is the main class, et cetera. So it's pretty simple and we're just reusing all existing concepts that have already been present in Java Web Start and the JNLP file format uh, for a long time. Okay, so let's, let me show you a quick demo of, um, of this. So these demos are on the web, by the way. Uh, you can go to jdk6.dev.java.net plugin2, and that'll take you to this page. I'm just in the demo section down here. I, maybe I'll increase the font size a little bit. Okay. So uh, what I'd like to show you, these are some demonstrations of the scene graph library that's underpinning the first release of Java FX. Okay, so the preview SDK for the new Java FX system went out uh, last week, I think. And these are some demonstrations of the Java scene graph that sits underneath it and lets you do things like, um, it lets you write object-oriented code to represent graphical scenes. This is the major sort of innovation. Instead of writing a lot of immediate or imperative code saying, draw this oval, draw this line, et cetera, you get to say, I want a group here with this transform, here's the oval, that's an object, and then a line over here. That's what makes it so much easier to produce this kind of you know, interesting looking content. It doesn't look like traditional Java content with you know, rectangular buttons and rectangular text fields and stuff. It's more you know, curved and rounded. So this is the library underneath things that, um, that gives you these kinds of effects. And we can do things like you know, play with this little egg timer. You know, there's a little calculator example, stuff like this. Now these demos are written um, against the scene graph extension and the scene graph extension is pulled in via a JNLP extension link. Okay, so your applet, you just build it normally in your IDE, and when you deploy it, you have one line in your XML file saying, I'm pointing off to this extension, and, and the new plugin basically takes all <coughs> the care of downloading the extension, caching it locally, et cetera. Um, and then finally, launching your application with the, uh, the classes and the extension available to you. And you can do some pretty neat stuff. You can take swing components and transform them arbitrarily. Uh, whoops. Um, there are some nifty shader effects present to do things like motion blur. Um, you got you know, very good performance on uh, dynamically animated content. Um, so anyway, lots of, uh, lots of fun stuff to play with. So encourage you to take a look at that. Again, these are linked off the, um, the Java plugin release notes. Okay. So, so this, this has covered the... Um, the basics of the new JNLP integration 
in the new Java plugin and, and some of what this provides. And more of the demonstrations later are gonna show other examples of pulling in JNLP extensions. Any questions? Please. Well, the, the main reason that you would want to provide a previous implementation or uh, an alternate part of your applet tag is if you wanted to maintain compatibility with older JREs, okay? And, you know, different customers have different needs and requirements here. Sometimes uh, you might just want to say, you know, you, you're going to need to upgrade, you're going to need to have 6 update 10 or later in order to run this content. But if, if your applet is phrased in a way that you can mostly, you, know, you can use most of the functionality and there's like a little bit of stuff that takes advantage of the new functionality, then you actually can write your applet tag in a way that the same applet tag and web page with no JavaScript or anything will be handled both by the old Java plugin and by the new Java plugin cleanly. So if you've got the new one, it'll see the JNLP href and it'll use that as the, you know, it'll replace all of the content effectively from the applet tag with the contents of the JNLP file. If you knew that your target audience had the new plugin, is there any reason you wouldn't use the new syntax plugin? Basically, no. You'd, you'd pretty much always want to use it. Um, although, uh, uh, let, one caveat, if, if, um, if you're really like trying to get something out there really fast, it's really simple, it's one class file or something, sometimes it's more convenient to use the old syntax. Okay. Um, but generally speaking, if you have any content of reasonable size, you're going to want to use the new JLP mechanism because the features that it gives you are just you know, much, much more powerful than you could do before. Any other questions? Please. Can you talk more about how, how it works? Um, or, or should yeah. I ask questions now? Please, Please ask, ask questions. questions. Some slides earlier, you gave the multiple process thing. Then you said everything. I, you seem to be saying that everything ran in the same JVM and it's applying to like no footprint. Implications. I, mean, I, I didn't understand how, how, that, how the statements added up to this picture. Okay, okay. So, so please uh, repeat the question for the video cast. Yes, definitely. So the, the question is, um, we were talking about multiple JVMs potentially being used to run applets, and yet also talking about no footprint impact of the new model, the new process model for the Java plugin, and sort of how do these things gel. So let me explain a little bit more. The, um, there's a, a, a constant cost overhead of the new Java plugin of the small headless JVM that's embedded in the web browser process. Okay, now this is an implementation detail in some sense. One could write this in a native language, C or C++, although there would be some major disadvantages to doing that because we actually use the same exact Java code both on the left side here inside the web browser <coughs> process and on the right side in any of the attached JVM instances that are used to run applets. And this is how we use Java code to serialize the messages back and forth between these VMs that say things like start an applet or I'm making a JavaScript to Java call and I need the result back at some future point, right? So by writing everything in Java, we got some major architectural advantages in simplicity of implementation, in code reuse, et cetera. Now, again, by default, um, all of the applets run in the same JVM instance, okay? So just as before, there used to be a, a JVM embedded in the web browser that would run all applets. It had a, the default heap size, you know, or maybe a little bit more, roughly 64 meg heap size, um, you know, certain J, uh, JVM command line arguments that you would specify in the control panel. By default, if you're just running old style applet content, that's exactly what you'll get. You'll get one VM attached to the browser that's running all the applets. So basically, it, you've got just the one fixed cost of the small embedded JVM, which has like a 16 meg max heap, doesn't come close to using that, so it's pretty, pretty slim. Yeah, but if you, if you create other, so, so, so the, base, the, the base cost is the same, right? I understand that. If you have these other, your own course process, those actually are other processes you can pay for them. Yes, yeah, so, so the, the point uh, Tim is making is that uh, if you start to spawn additional VMs, then yes, you will pay a cost for you know, the additional overhead there. Um, I should point out that these VM instances, you know, will time out if they're idle for a certain period of time. So actually, you'll get lower footprint with the new plugin if you visit a page and there's some Java on it, then you browse away and there's no Java for a while. It'll actually shut down that attached VM. So, you know, in a steady state, the footprint is actually uh, pretty small. 
cool. Other questions? Any other questions? Okay, so let's, um, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, interaction with the outside world. Um, so Java JavaScript integration is a really powerful thing that's been present in some form for a very long time, since the very early Netscape browsers. And it's, it's a real tragedy that it wasn't, in some sense, more robust or more you know, beat up on by use cases. Um, and this is one thing that we tried very, very hard to address, and I think that we've got a, a good solution at this point. So the, the mechanism by which Java and JavaScript interoperate has been completely rewritten in the new Java plugin. All right? And there are some very exciting properties of the new implementation. Number one is the new implementation of this bridge is actually written mostly in Java. It's surprising that it's actually possible to write this kind of thing mostly in Java. Um, we have the, the smallest amount of native code to glue into the browser's JavaScript engine. And from there, we get up into Java and then up into platform-independent Java as quickly as possible. And from that point, this interlanguage bridge is built only with message passing. All right, so it's just sending messages over our inter-process communication mechanism back and forth. So number one, the implementation is much more complete than it has ever been. So when you're calling from Java down to JavaScript, um, there's a JS object class which represents all of the JavaScript objects. And the calls against them look a lot like reflective method calls. You can do, uh, you know, call a method, you can fetch a, uh, a property of the JavaScript object, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm proud to say that the support for this is more complete than it ever has been. All of the methods actually work now on all browsers. So you can do things, finally, like interact with JavaScript arrays uniformly across browsers. This works, all right? Um, you, can, uh, you can call methods in, you know, against JavaScript objects works 100%, all right? So functionality that has sometimes not been supported in the past is now working correctly on all web browsers. Um, this means, by the way, that you can write both Java code and JavaScript code and just not worry, oops, not worry about the browser on which you're deploying. It's just gonna work as long as the new plugin is there. Um, there's another cool thing which I'll give a demonstration of in a minute, which is that in the past, the best Java JavaScript integration has been on the Firefox browser family, the Mozilla browser family. There you could call static methods on Java classes. You could create new Java objects from JavaScript. So you really had a, a nice, tight, interlanguage binding. Now you can do the same stuff on Internet Explorer and any other browser where the new Java plugin's available. And I'll show you some examples of this. So what we're doing, we've got the opportunity to re-specify and reintroduce Live Connect to the Java developer. Um, and we're excited about this, to finally be able to say, okay, this support really works, it's really robust, and you can rely on it. You can build applications around it. Now, another uh, sort of sister technology to the Java JavaScript bridge is DOM access. Um, now, since Java 1.4, it's been possible to talk to the document object model around your applet, iterate down it, modify it, um, but the, the coverage, to be honest, was a little bit spotty. Right? It wasn't really heavily tested. Some of the methods weren't implemented. So the DOM access via the W3C APIs has been completely rewritten, and it's built on top of the new Java JavaScript bridge. It was before, but the implementation's been radically simplified in a lot of, a lot of ways. Another cool thing that's been simplified is how you actually get access to the DOM in the first place. So before, you had to make these runnables effectively and hand off the work to another thread, but this is no longer necessary because the new Java JavaScript bridge is implicitly thread safe, okay? All of the communication back to the web browser ultimately gets funneled down onto one single thread, and that is 100% reliable. So this is how you fetch the DOM for your applet. You just call dom.getDocument, and then you have the, do the document. You can cast down to HTML documents if you like, and then you can iterate the DOM. You can modify it if you like. Of course, if you're trying to do this for multiple simultaneous Java threads, you do have to worry about whether one thread is yanking out the piece of the DOM that the other one's about to put content into or something. Um, but that's more of a, a rendering question as opposed to a correctness or a, a crashing question, all right? You're not gonna crash the browser, um, but you should take care if you're trying to do document object model modifications from multiple threads. And so this allows you to use Java as an Ajax engine. All right, you can use Java's built-in multi-threading capability to potentially have a much simpler conceptual model for your app, and then 
Java can drive the modification of the surrounding web page. So I'm pretty excited about this, and would, um, there's a demo out there on the Java plugin release notes that I would definitely encourage you to give it a try and give us some feedback. So let me give you a quick demo of what this looks like. All right, so this is not the most exciting uh, set of test cases, but um, let, me, let me show you the, the page source here. All right, that's the most interesting aspect. All right, so we create one simple applet up here, okay? This applet does nothing. It just, it's like a no-op, just gets itself instantiated. And note that we name the applet on the web page, and we've, we've taken the opportunity to add a little bit of functionality to the Live Connect uh, concept, Live Connect Bridge. So basically, everything's object-oriented, and everything's scoped around a particular applet instance. So we can take our test applet and use the package's keyword against it, and that lets us dive into the namespace that's defined by that applet. So you can call static methods in classes that you define in your applet from JavaScript. You can create new Java objects that are in namespaces defined by your applet from JavaScript. This really works. I mean, you know, finally, this is portable and it's robust. So you really can rely on this ability. So for example, we can do things like call um, static methods in the core libraries, like javalang integer.parsint. So if we do that, this little test um, pops up an alert dialog that you know, puts the result up, all right? Um, system out print is less exciting because we'd have to open the Java console. Here's an example that calls javaxswing.japption pane to pop up maybe a more full-featured message dialog than you could get with you know, built-in browser APIs, okay? So here we call this and note that we've got the little you know, alert notification saying that this is an unsigned applet window, okay? So it's, it's still, um, still safe as it used to be. Um, here's a more complex example that really scripts things at a fairly deep level. It creates a new swing JFrame, uh, sets the default close operation, makes a text field, adds some text to, uh, sets some text, sets up the size of the frame, and then sets it to be visible. So if we run this from JavaScript, you know, we can do some pretty neat stuff. You know, you can actually start to do real GUI scripting from JavaScript, so you can have a very flexible uh, kind of app and, and do neat stuff. All right, so all of this stuff is really portable, runs on every platform. If you got the new Java plugin, this stuff works, guaranteed. Um, I personally guarantee it. All right, so um, again, these examples are all up on the Java plugin release notes that are on jdk6.dev.java.net, uh, and I will, again, um, these slides will be available so that you can have the links. Okay, so this is sort of the baseline functionality. Now, what can you do with all this cool stuff? All right, you can make really sophisticated applets that, that do as much as a desktop application does. Or you can, again, tweak the, um, the hardware acceleration parameters and pull in 3D graphical acceleration libraries. So I'd like to show you some, uh, some really cool demos that have been written by uh, stellar teams out there on the web. All right, so here's an example that's uh, produced by our friends over in uh, Moffett Field at NASA Ames Research Center. This is their WorldWind Java software, all right? So NASA, for a, a number of years, has been working on a, um, an Earth visualization package that they call WorldWind. And in recent years, they've actually taken this technology and rewritten it using pure Java code. So this software is 100% Java and rests on top of the Java OpenGL libraries, which provide hardware accelerated 3D graphics access on all platforms, by the way. OpenGL is a uh, it's an industry standard, cross-platform standard, runs on every kind of Unix and, and Windows and Mac platform that you have out there. All right, so this example visualizes the cascade range. It's using some text courtesy of Wikipedia. And you can visualize the Earth simultaneously in the web page, right? So we can, I mean, this is a web page, right? There's some flickering issues. My bug, actually, I think. Um, but um, you can visualize stuff in 3D on the web, this runs portably, all right? This web page will render on any platform out there that has Java support, basically. And it's also written in a way that it, while it uses the new Java plugin features, they also have a version of this that runs with the, for, the earlier version of the Java plugin, so it really runs you know, on any machine from you know, the past, I don't know, five, seven years, okay? So you really can get um, broad deployments of this kind of content in the browser. All right, now, this is interesting and nifty enough, but it doesn't really show the capability. So 
we've got a bunch of HTML links here in the web page. And you can see in the status bar that it's actually, each one of these is linked up to a JavaScript call. So if we click this link, it'll call into the applet and tell it to do something. All right, so watch this. So we can click the Mount Rainier link, and it'll just drive us over to that part of the Earth. All right? Um, maybe we want to go check out Mount Adams or something. All right. Navigate us over there really smoothly. All right? This is a, a fully live view. All right? We can come in here and interact with this thing. All right? And this is on a web page. There was no software installation at all. Um, the, the most that you would get is a one-time security dialogue asking, do you want to trust software from NASA Ames Research Center? The user accepts that, the program runs. There's no software installation of any kind. This runs on the Mac, runs on Windows, runs on Linux, runs on Solaris, okay? Um, so this is the kind of uh, really nifty applet deployment that we've been trying to enable with the new Java plugin. Really robust, fast, hardware-accelerated 3D content on the web. Question. So is this live data, do you like drag it across the country and we actually pull in other states? Absolutely. Um, we can, that's a good question. We can come in here and zoom out. I mean, this is a fully live map, right? So we can come in. Where do you want to go? All right, so just come in here. All right, here's Manhattan. This is on the web, right? I mean, it's. The, the, the cool and powerful concept is that this, uh, this WorldWinds component is embeddable in your Java program, your Java application, your Java applet, and now you can deploy it uniformly, on the web, off the web. Doesn't really matter, okay? It's, there's a very uniform deployment model. Okay, any other questions? Please. Uh, that mean that I didn't get all the question. Can you say it a little bit louder? Tell me about the Google Web Toolkit. Does this bridge today with JavaScript? And I don't know if you've heard about it. Yeah, I mean, I got I to gotta profess ignorance on some of, uh, some of that. I mean, I know about the GWT and that it, I thought that it compiled down to JavaScript so that, right. yeah. Um, I think I think so, right? I mean, I think I think that what we've got here is a robust and reliable enough means of getting Java content hooked into the browser and integrating with your surrounding JavaScript code that you can now rely on it, right? I mean, you know, in previous versions of the Java plugin, you could do this, but you know, there there were some implementation problems that might have given you some reliability issues or something that obviously you don't want in your widespread consumer deployments. All right, so what I'm, I'm here to say today is that we've solved these issues and that this stuff is really robust now. Um, and you can rely on the, the behavior of the Java JavaScript bridge in the new system. Okay. Other question? Is it useful for me to have some benchmarks about the performance of this versus Flash and Flash plugin in terms of number of frames, <coughs> number of objects, that kind of thing? Um, that's sort of, you know, there's a lot of dimensions to that question, right? I mean, depending on exactly how you're putting your graphical content on the screen, I mean, you may choose to use uh, OpenGL directly, although maybe that's not, a, you know, in some sense is platform independent as using pure Java code via Java 2D. But Java 2D has new hardware acceleration in 6 Update 10, by the way, that gives it in dra dramatically higher performance on you know, wide ranges of, um, of Java content. So it kind of depends on the kind of content you're tr that you're trying to put out there. Um, in terms of raw Java JavaScript performance, which is, is, is that part of your question, or is it mainly about the graphical performance? It's about the graphical performance, uh, which is <clears throat> my team is using Flash because uh, JavaScript and Ajax could not uh, perform at that level. Uh, but I'm wondering whether this could, if it were pure Java rendering. I, I think that we can, yes. I mean, I, I would. I would vouch for the performance of the Java VM and the Java libraries um, compared to competing web technologies. I think the main problem that we've had in web deployments has not been the, uh, the performance. It's been the reliability. It's been the robustness. All right? And that's what we've 
addressed in this new release of the Java plugin. So you know, with this release, I can really you know, put a stamp on it and say, yes, you know, we are ready for the, the widespread consumer Java deployments. Um, and I'd be very happy to talk with you more offline about that and about uh, you know, certain domains, et cetera. But I mean, you can see that the performance is pretty good here, right? And this is pure Java code, um, dynamically generating the terrain every frame as you're animating across the world. Other questions? Okay, so let me show you another example. Um, let's, let me shut this down and go over here. All right, so a few years ago, some crazy guys in Germany that call themselves Bytonic Software um, ported, they, they took the GPL'd Quake 2 source code from id Software and they transliterated it to Java. So you, this is actually possible. I mean, C and Java have similar syntaxes and there are some idioms that you can use, like a C function pointer can be converted into a Java interface, for example. So they used a bunch of these idioms. They didn't re-architect Quake 2, they just transliterated it. And then they used the Java OpenGL binding underneath to actually get the triangles and the textures and everything onto the screen. Now for a long period of time, you've been able to go out on the web and go to their website and click a link and it'll use Java Web Start to run the game. So as long as you have Java, there's no installation. Click the link, game runs. On your desktop, full screen or not, you know, anything, any choice that you make. And we thought that it would be interesting to see what you could do with the new capability of the Java plugin and the ability to get this kind of content running as an applet instead. So here's the user experience, okay, please watch. So I'm gonna click this link, it's gonna pop up a new browser window, it's gonna show us a little animation for a second, and then the game is running. <sighs> All right, and this, this really runs. I mean, you know, we can come in here and uh, I, I suck, so. All right, but, you know. All right so we can you know, come in here and like, you know, get the armor and stuff. All right, all right, fine. So, you know, enough about that, right? But, um, but the point is, there's no software installation by the end user at all. The user experience is, you've got Java installed, you go to the web page, game is running. This is the future of game distribution on the internet, all right? No need for, C for DVDs or CDs anymore. Just you attract people to your website with your compelling content. Um, and by the way, it's really easy to repackage this as a Java Web Start application so that you can uh, run it in a you know, more offline manner than going to the web page. And we have a little more to talk about that uh, right now, actually. So um, any questions about this? Okay, oh, question. Um, so the Java plugin comes with every Java installation? Yes. And then, roughly, what's the penetration of Java on the desktop? Like, you know, Flash is kind of everywhere. Java, Java is basically is everywhere as well. I don't have the marketing numbers in front of me. We're, uh, we're on like more than 90% of the PCs out there, and we actually ship with the majority of the, PC, the new PCs uh, going out every day. Um, we have auto-update mechanisms to you know, get users onto the latest versions of Java, and we are aiming to get this much more powerful release of the Java plugin onto the majority of the desktops out there as soon as we can. I mean, this is Sun's general goal. Exactly. So the point, point is um, that you want to ensure that you get good market penetration by availability of the plugin that you rely on. Couldn't agree with you more. And, um, you know, Java, a, a certain, at least some version of the Java plugin is available on, like, again, almost all PCs. Of course, this version is brand new. It's, it's release is imminent. It's not actually out there publicly released yet. So it's going to be a little while before it gets that market penetration. But we anticipate that the mechanisms that we already have in place are going to enable broad penetration of this in the market once we flip the switch and auto update to it. Question in the back. Oh, yeah. Want to, want to show? Okay, same web page. Okay. Same link. Game runs. Nothing up my sleeve. <laughs> Sound works good. All right. Okay. So, and, and yeah, this works on, well, it works on every platform that's supported by the new Java plugin, let's say. 
All right, this one really does rely on the capabilities of the new plugin, by the way. It's, it's an application, it's written as an app. It wasn't designed to run as an applet, so we're using some new functionality that's documented in the new plugin's release notes to completely wall off this applet into its own JVM instance. So it really just, it's, a, it's an application, only it happens to be displaying its content in the web browser. Right. And you need that for stuff like, because it's got global networking state, and it really doesn't work well if, you've, if you're running it from two different you know, threads within the same VM. Um, question. How difficult <coughs> is it to port the new plugin to a new browser? That's a good question. We've really tried to refactor it into the, like, as much as possible and get as much code shared as possible. So it really takes a, a matter of a couple of days and a couple of thousand lines of code to port this to a new browser. Um, even the Java JavaScript bridge has been refactored into the absolute minimal number of native methods that you have to implement. And once you implement those you know, 20 to 30 little native methods that are a couple lines each for the particular web browser, then you can just call from Java to JavaScript. All right, so even that bridge has been refactored. And so we're happy to say that this is quite portable. Uh, question in the back. Um, how does it work when the user is offline? Is it still able to play games? Or? Well, it, it's a good question. So we, I, I'm going to show an example in a, a couple of minutes that shows some, um, some interesting new possibilities of bridging between <coughs> online and offline content. Um, ideally, we would probably figure out some way to, um, to allow applets once run with the new plugin to run in offline mode. So in other words, if you... Um, if you had a JNLP applet, then you could effectively run that as an application if the applet allowed it to be run in offline mode. But we, that having been said, we actually have some new interesting possibilities in this domain that I'm going to show you in a minute. So if you can, if you can wait two minutes, uh, we'll, I think we can show you some cool stuff. Um, other questions? Please. You mentioned the user clicking through a uh, trust this applet dialog. How many of these capabilities are available to unsigned applets? Well, let's see. Um, the only reason that you would need to click the security dialog is if you want to use, for example, the Java OpenGL binding, which has some native code. OK, so it's really only if you've got a, p a native code component or you need, say, access to the local disk. WorldWind Java um, has an on-disk cache, and it, it, it can't you know, it can't really work within the confines of the applet sandbox because it, it just needs to cache these, these imagery tiles on disk. So that's why it, um, it needs the additional privileges. Yeah, but I mean, stuff like uh, Java JavaScript integrations, all this works from unsigned applets. Yeah, the baseline functionality all works. Any other questions? Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's move on to a couple of, uh, a couple of other pieces. <laughs> Top topics. Okay, let's see. All right, now, um, here's something I hope you'll find kind of interesting. All right, so in addition to the, the, the baseline rewrite and the improved robustness and reliability of the Java plugin, we've, in, we've incorporated some experimental new functionality. And what we've been trying to do is to blur the distinction between in-browser and out-of-browser content using the Java platform. Okay, now you've already seen that by reusing the Java Web Start concepts, we've been able to get some really interesting unification between how you develop your Java content and how you get it onto the user's PC, either inside the browser or outside the browser. But we're actually trying to take this a step further to change the nature of application distribution and deployment. All right, so let me show you a little demonstration. Okay. So these are some applets that we developed uh, for Java 1 2008. Uh, they're written using Java FX, the current version that's out there uh, in the preview SDK. Actually, you know, to be honest, these applets are written against a, an even earlier version of the Java FX runtime, and we're working on porting these to the, the preview SDK that's out there. So let me just give you a quick you know, run through of these. So these are some really simple applets um, that are built using the new Java FX uh, script language and runtime system. So here's a stopwatch, okay? It, it tells the time, all right? It's got really whizzy gradients and stuff, looks cool, looks almost 3D. Uh, it's got drop shadows on the second hand and stuff. Um, very nifty, very compelling. Another point is that this thing is fully vector graphic, so you could scale it up or shrink it down arbitrarily and it would still look perfectly smooth, all right? So here's one little example of something that you could do. Um, 
Here's another example. This is a buddy list. Okay, it shows you your friends' names, shows you the weather that where they are, shows you uh, the, the time zone that they're in, and it even shows you where they are. Okay, we can come in here and click our friend's name, and it'll pop up a 3D view of the Earth and take us to where they live. All right, using the NASA WorldWind Java technology. So this is showing interoperability between existing Java components and the Java FX stack and the ability to take your Java swing thing and embed it in your FX scene and it all interoperates really, really smoothly. Okay. Here's a third example. This, uh, this shows the hot movies of the day as of May of 2008. Um, so this is what was in the theaters at the time. Uh, shows you the movie posters, shows you a little uh, synopsis of what's going on, and we can even play a trailer of the movie. All right, this is showing off the new media support in the um, in the Java FX runtime. Okay, and what I'll point out is uh, Java FX filter effects are being used. To, uh, to do the effects like the you know, fake little movie strip and you know, a little jittering at the top and the bottom and stuff. All right, so it's, it's showing the ability to process the video in real time as it's going out onto the screen. Okay, so these are all well and good, you know, very nifty little effects. Okay, now this buddy list, this buddy list actually might be useful, right? Maybe it would even incorporate an instant messaging client or something into it. And maybe you'd want to use it beyond your visit to this particular web page, okay? So with the new Java plugin, here's what you can do. You, you try it on the web page, you like it. So we'll just take the applet, okay, and we'll drag it out of the web browser onto our desktop, okay? That's the installation step. Now I'll come in here and completely quit the web browser, and the applet is still running, all right? So on the fly, completely dynamically, this applet transforms from a JNLP launched applet into a Java Web Start application. No state is changed in any way. It's the same running applet application instance, okay? We simply dynamically change how the services are provided to this applet on the fly. So if this applet, for example, used the show document functionality to view a web page in another frame on the, on the same page that it used to live in, now it would open a new web browser window because it doesn't have a web page to talk to anymore. If it was uh, querying things like proxy settings, instead of going back to the web browser, it would now delegate down to the system proxy settings, which are, you know, again, system dependent, okay? If it was making Java JavaScript calls, then those would begin to throw JS exception instead of completing. Okay, so there's a very graceful degrading of the services that are provided to the applet in this model. And the user can request in their JNLP file, just like they can for a Java Web Start application, uh, speaking to the question from earlier, you can request that a shortcut be created for your applet. When it gets disconnected from the web browser, we get, you get the little dialog saying, do you want to create shortcuts for this app? If you say yes, then it creates the shortcuts, and then you can double click or run from the you know, start menu or whatever the system GUI option is. You can rerun that applet later without going back to the web page. So this is the installation step. Take the live app out of the browser, put it on your desktop, that's it, all right? Retains as many of the services as we can provide reasonably to the thing. Basically transforms into a Java Web Start application dynamically. Um, only with Java. Okay, so I'll shut that down. Um, and there is actually more to talk about, um, more functionality that's in the new Java plugin, which we just don't have time to discuss, all right? So there's backward and forward compatibility mechanisms, uh, talking to one of the questions from before. Uh, there are examples on the web page of how you write your applet tag in a way that runs with older versions of the Java plugin and the new one. Um, there's multiple JRE version support for enterprises. If you want to QA your applet against a particular version of Java, you can do that and you can run it simultaneously side by side with applets that are hosted in other versions of the Java runtime, which is new. Um, you can uh, move your, th this has uh, been there for a while, this functionality, but you can move the, the update checks for your app into the background. That'll improve your startup time pretty dramatically um, without changing your code in any way. 
Um, we finally have support for cross-domain policy files. So unsigned applet content can gain access to web services from other vendors that are published, all right? Got a thumbs up from the audience there, that's good. Um, you've got better control over the loading screen so you can get rid of any, you know, sun branding and keep your company's brand there and you can get some animation in there. Um, more stuff to talk about, so please take a look at the release notes. Um, they're on the web and there will be pointers uh, available later. So what I'd like to, the thesis, the thesis of this talk, and I don't know whether I've convinced you all, but the thesis is that applets are back. And what I'd like to do is leave this, uh, this thank you slide up for a while. Um, the development team worked really, really hard for over a year in order to get this stuff uh, out there nonstop. Um, the, uh, the testing organization did work evenings and weekends in order to QA this stuff in parallel to the stuff that was going on with the mainline product until this became the mainline product. And then we had to partner with many uh, valuable uh, partners in order to get this stuff out there. Uh, Mozilla was very uh, helpful. It wouldn't have happened without them, basically. They had, to, they had to gut the Java JavaScript bridge and allow us to replace it with a much, much simpler one in order for this to succeed in the Firefox uh, browsers, and it did in Firefox 3. So anyway, so many people to, uh, to thank, and of course, uh, manager Gustavo Galamberti for sticking his neck out so many times, and James Gosling and Bob Bruin for giving us moral support from the project's beginning. So I'll leave this up and ask if there are any uh, further questions in the audience, please. Uh, you didn't talk about 64-bit? Uh, I didn't mention 64-bit explicitly. What I can say is that the new Java plugin compiled completely cleanly in 64-bit mode the first time it was tried. Um, and we are aiming to get a 64-bit version of the plugin out there soon. Please. Because you run the applets in separate JVMs, it should, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, be possible to run some of the applets 64-bit if needed. Uh, that is absolutely correct, yes. Um, the applet itself, you can specify dash D64, for example, and then you can have a 32-bit browser running a 64-bit applet. Yeah, that, that actually works. And on, on some platforms where there may only be a 64-bit Java 6 available, um, some proof of concept prototypes have been built that actually bootstrap off the 32-bit browser and the applets run in the JRE 6 in 64-bit mode. So that does work. Please. Uh, I think that you could be doing that in 64 apps only work on some of I don't think they work on Linux. Uh, that I don't know. I thought that they did, actually. So it's fine. I thought that they worked on as well, but I could be wrong. Not 100% sure. But it basic, uh, the, the basic concept is that the, you can run a 64-bit applet from a 32-bit browser. I mean, that works in this architecture. Yeah. Uh, other question? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for having me, and uh, have a good day.